Chapter Two of the Misplaced Battleship by Harry Harrison. Chapter Two. The ship was completely clean. Everything I might need for the job was in my luggage. Some of it quite lethal and explosive and very embarrassing if it was discovered in my bags. In the safety of my hotel suite I made a change of clothes and personality, after the robot had checked the room for bugs. And very nice gadgets, too, these core robots. It looked and acted like a moron M3 all the time. It was anything but. The brain was as good as any other robot brain I have known, plus the fact that the chunky body was crammed with devices and machines of varying use. It chugged slowly around the room, moving my bags and laying out my kit, and all the time following a careful route that covered every inch of the suite. When it had finished it stopped and called the all-clear. All rooms checked. Result negative, except for one optic bug in that wall. Should you be pointing like that? I asked the robot. Might make some people suspicious, you know. Impossible, the robot said with mechanical surety. I brushed against it, and it is now unserviceable. With this assurance I pulled off my flashy clothes and slipped into the midnight black dress uniform of an admiral in the League Grand Fleet. It came complete with decorations, gold bullion, and all the necessary documents. I thought it a little showy myself, but it was just the thing to make the right impression in Sita Nuvo. Like many other planets, this one was uniform conscious. The livery boys, street cleaners, clerks, all had to have characteristic uniforms, much prestige attached to them and my black dress outfit should rate as high as any uniform in the galaxy. A long cloak would conceal the uniform while I left the hotel, but the gold-encrusted helmet and a briefcase of papers were a problem. I had never explored all the possibilities of the pseudo-M3 robot. Perhaps it could be of help. You there, short and chunky, I called. Do you have any concealed compartments or drawers built into your steel hide? If so, let's see. For a second I thought the robot had exploded. The thing had more drawers in it than a battery of cash registers. Big, small, flat, thin, they shot out on all sides. One held a gun and two more were stuffed with grenades. The rest were empty. I put the hat in one, the briefcase in another, and snapped my fingers. The drawers slid shut and its metal hide was as smooth as ever. I pulled on a fancy sports cap, buckled the cape up tight, and was ready to go. The luggage was all booby-trapped and could defend itself. Guns, gas, poison needles, the usual sort of thing. In the last resort it would blow itself up. The M3 went down by a freight elevator. I used a back stairs and we met in the street. Since it was still daylight I didn't take a heli, but rented a ground car instead. We had a leisurely drive out into the country and reached President Ferraro's house after dark. As befitted the top official of a rich planet, the place was a mansion. But the security precautions were ludicrous, to say the least. I took myself and a 350-kilo robot through the guards and alarms without causing the slightest stir. President Ferraro, a bachelor, was eating his dinner. This gave me enough undisturbed time to reach his study. There was absolutely nothing. Nothing to do with wars or battleships, that is. If I had been interested in blackmail, I had enough evidence in my hand to support me for life. I was looking for something bigger than political corruption, however. When Ferraro rolled into his study after dinner, the room was dark. I heard him murmur something about the servants and fumble for the switch. Before he found it, the robot closed the door and turned on the lights. I sat behind his desk, all his personal papers before me, weighted down with a pistol, and as fierce a scowl as I could raise smeared across my face. Before he got over the shock I snapped an order at him. Come over here and sit down, quick. The robot hustled him across the room at the same time, so he had no choice except to obey. When he saw the papers on the desk, his eyes bulged and he just gurgled a little. 
Before he could recover, I threw a thick folder in front of him. I am Admiral Thar, League Grand Fleet. These are my credentials. You had better check them. Since they were as good as any rear admirals, I didn't worry in the slightest. Ferraro went through them as carefully as he could in his rattled state, even checking the seals under UV. It gave him time to regain a bit of control, and he used it to bluster. What do you mean by entering my private quarters and burglaring? You're in very bad trouble, I said in as gloomy a voice as I could muster. Ferraro's tanned face went a dirty gray at my words. I pressed the advantage. I am arresting you for conspiracy, extortion, theft, and whatever other charges developed after a careful review of these documents. Seize him. This last order was directed at the robot, who was well briefed in its role. It rumbled forward and locked its hand around Ferraro's wrist, handcuff style. He barely noticed. I can explain, he said desperately. Everything can be explained. There is no need to make such charges. I don't know what papers you have there, so I wouldn't attempt to say they are all forgeries. I have many enemies, you know. If the League knew the difficulties faced on a backward planet like this, that will be entirely enough, I snapped, cutting him off with a wave of my hand. All those questions will be answered by a court at the proper time. There is only one question I want an answer to now. Why are you building that battleship? The man was a great actor. His eyes opened wide, his jaw dropped, he sank back into the chair as if he had been tapped lightly with a hammer. When he managed to speak, the words were completely unnecessary. He had already registered every evidence of injured innocence. What battleship? he gasped. The Warlord-class battleship that is being built at the Cenerentola spaceyards, disguised behind these blueprints. I threw them across the desk to him and pointed to one corner. Those are your initials, authorizing construction. Ferraro still had the baffled act going as he fumbled with the papers, examined the initials and such. I gave him plenty of time. He finally put them down, shaking his head. I know nothing about any battleship. These are plans for a new cargo liner. Those are my initials. I recall putting them there. I phrased my question carefully, as I had him right where I wanted him now. You deny any knowledge of the Warlord battleship that is being built from these modified plans? These are the plans for an ordinary passenger freighter. That is all I know. His words had the simple innocence of a young child's. Was he ever caught? I sat back with a relaxed sigh and lit a cigar. Wouldn't you be interested in knowing something about that robot who was holding you? I said. He looked down as if aware for the first time that the robot had been holding him by the wrist during the interview. That is no ordinary robot. It has a number of interesting devices built into its fingertips. Thermocouples, galvanometers, things like that. While you talked, it registered your skin temperature, blood pressure, amount of perspiration and such. In other words, it is an efficient and fast-working lie detector. We will now hear all about your lies. Ferraro pulled away from the robot's hand as if it had been a poisonous snake. I blew a relaxed smoke ring. Report, I said to the robot. Has this man told any lies? Many, the robot said. Exactly seventy-four percent of all statements he made were fake. Very good, I nodded, throwing the last lock on my trap. That means he knows all about this battleship. The subject has no knowledge of the battleship, the robot said coldly. All of his statements concerning the construction of this ship were true. Now it was my turn for the gaping and eye-popping act, while Ferraro pulled himself together. He had no idea I wasn't interested in his other hanky-panky, but could tell I had had a low blow. It took an effort, but I managed to get my mind back into gear and consider the evidence. If President Ferraro didn't know about the battleship, he must have been taken in by the cover-up job. But if he wasn't responsible, who was? 
some militaristic clique that meant to overthrow him and take power? I didn't know enough about the planet, so I enlisted Ferraro on my side. That was easy, even without the threat of exposure of the documents I had found in his files. Using their disclosure as a prod, I could have made him jump through hoops. It wasn't necessary. As soon as I showed him the different blueprints and explained the possibilities, he understood. If anything, he was more eager than I to find out who was using his administration as a cat's paw. By silent agreement, the documents were forgotten. We agreed that the next logical step would be the Cenerentola spaceyards. He had some idea of sniffing around quietly first, trying to get a line to his political opponents. I gave him to understand that the League, and the League Navy in particular, wanted to stop the construction of the battleship. After that he could play his politics. With this point understood, he called his car and squadron of guards, and we made a parade to the shipyards. It was a four-hour drive, and we made plans on the way down. The spaceyard manager was named Roca, and he was happily asleep when we arrived, but not for long. The parade of uniforms and guns in the middle of the night had him frightened into a state where he could hardly walk. I imagine he was as full of petty larceny as Ferraro. No innocent man could have looked so terror-stricken. Taking advantage of the situation, I latched my motorized lie detector onto him and began snapping the questions. Even before I had all the answers, I began to get the drift of things. They were a little frightening, too. The manager of the spaceyard that was building the ship had no idea of its true nature. Anyone with less self-esteem than myself, or who had led a more honest early life, might have doubted his own reasoning at that moment. I didn't. The ship on the ways still resembled a warship to six places, and knowing human nature the way I do, that was too much of a coincidence to expect. Occam's razor always points the way. If there are two choices to take, take the simpler. In this case I chose the natural acquisitive instinct of man, as opposed to blind chance and accident. Nevertheless, I put the theory to the test. Looking over the original blueprints again, the big superstructure hit my eye. In order to turn the ship into a warship, that would have to be one of the first things to go. Roca, I barked in what I hoped was authentic old space dog manner. Look at these plans. At this space-going front porch here. Is it still being built onto the ship? He shook his head at once and said, No, the plans were changed. We had to fit in some kind of new meteor-repelling gear for operating in the planetary debris belt. I flipped through my case and drew out a plan. Does your new gear look anything like this? I asked, throwing it across the table to him. He rubbed his jaw while he looked at it. Well, he said hesitatingly, I don't want to say for certain. After all, these details aren't in my department. I'm just responsible for final assembly, not unit work. But this surely looks like the thing they installed. Big thing, lots of power leads. It was a battleship, all right, no doubt of that now. I mentally reached around to pat myself on the back when the meaning of his words sank in. Installed? I shouted. Did you say installed? Roca collapsed away from my roar and gnawed his nails. Yes, he said. Not too long ago. I remember there was some trouble. And what else? I interrupted him. Cold moisture was beginning to collect along my spine now. The drives, controls, are they in too? Why, yes, he said. How did you know? The normal scheduling was changed around, causing a great deal of unnecessary trouble. The cold sweat was now a running river of fear. I was beginning to have the feeling that I had been missing the boat all along the line. The original estimated date of completion was nearly a year away, but there was no real reason why that couldn't be changed, too. Cars, guns, I bellowed, to the space yard. If that ship is anywhere near completion, we are in big, big trouble. All the board guards had a great time with the sirens, lights, accelerators on the floor, and that sort of thing. We blasted a screaming hole through the night, right to the space yard and through the gate. 
It didn't make any difference. We were still too late. A uniformed watchman frantically waved to us, and the whole convoy jerked to a stop. The ship was gone. Rocca couldn't believe it. Neither could the President. They wandered up and down the empty ways where it had been built. I just crunched down in the back of the car, chewing my cigar to pieces, and cursing myself for being a fool. I had missed the obvious fact, being carried away by the thought of a planetary government building a warship. The government was involved, for sure, but only as a pawn. No little planet-bound military mind could have dreamed up as big a scheme as this. I smelled a rat, a stainless steel one, someone who operated the way I had done before my conversion. Now that the rodent was well out of the bag, I knew just where to look, and had a pretty good idea of what I would find. Rocca, the spaceyard manager, had staggered back and was pulling at his hair, cursing and crying at the same time. President Ferraro had his gun out and was staring at it grimly. It was hard to tell if he was thinking of murder or suicide. I didn't care which. All he had to worry about was the next election, when the voters and the political competition would carve him up for losing the ship. My troubles were a little bigger. I had to find the battleship before it blasted its way across the galaxy. Roca, I shouted, get into the car. I want to see your records, all your records, and I want to see them right now. He climbed wearily in, and had directed the driver before he fully realized what was happening. Blinking at the sickly light of dawn brought him slowly back to reality. But, Admiral, the hour! Everyone will be asleep! I just growled, but it was enough. Rocca caught the idea from my expression, and grabbed the car phone. The office doors were open when we got there. Normally I cursed the paper tangles of bureaucracy, but this was one time when I blessed them all. These people had it down to a fine science, not a rivet fell, but that its fall was noted in quadruplicate, and later followed up with a memo, rivet, wastage, query. The facts I needed were all neatly tucked away in their paper catacombs. All I had to do was sniff them out. I didn't try to look for first causes. This would have taken too long. Instead, I concentrated my attention on the recent modifications, like the gun turret, that would quickly give me a trail to the guilty parties. Once the clerks understood what I had in mind, they hurled themselves into their work, urged on by the fires of patriotism and the burning voices of their superiors. All I had to do was suggest a line of search, and the relevant documents would begin appearing at once. Bit by bit, a pattern started to emerge, a delicate webwork of forgery, bribery, chicanery, and falsehood. It could only have been conceived by a mind as brilliantly crooked as my own. I chewed my lip with jealousy. Like all great ideas, this one was basically simple. A party, or parties unknown, had neatly warped the ship construction program to their own ends. Undoubtedly they had started the program for the giant transport that would have to be checked later, and once the program was under way it had been guided with a skill that bordered on genius. Orders were originated in many places, passed on, changed and shuffled. I painfully traced each one to its source. Many times the source was a forgery. Some changes seemed to be unexplainable until I noticed the officers in question had a temporary secretary while their normal assistants were ill. All the girls had food poisoning, a regular epidemic, it seemed. Each of them, in turn, had been replaced by the same girl. She stayed just long enough in each position to see that the battleship plan moved forward one more notch. The girl was obviously the assistant to the mastermind who originated the scheme. He sat in the center of the plot, like a spider on its web, pulling the strings that set things into motion. My first thought that a gang was involved proved wrong. All my secondary suspects turned out to be simple forgeries, not individuals. 
In the few cases where forgery wasn't adequate, my mysterious X had apparently hired himself to do the job. X himself had the permanent job of assistant engineering designer. One by one, the untangled threads ran to his office. He also had a secretary whose illnesses coincided with her employment in other offices. When I straightened up from my desk, the ache in my back stabbed like a hot wire. I swallowed a painkiller and looked around at my drooping, slack-eyed assistants who had shared the sleepless seventy-two-hour task. They sat or slumped against the furniture, waiting for my conclusions. Even President Ferraro was there, his hair looking scraggly where he had pulled out handfuls. "'You found them, the criminal ring?' he asked, his fingers groping over his scalp for a fresh hold. "'I have found them, yes,' I said hoarsely, but not a criminal ring. An inspired master criminal, who apparently has more executive ability in one earlobe than all your bribe-bloated bureaucrats and his female assistant. They pulled the entire job by themselves. His name, or undoubtedly pseudoname, is Pepe Nero. The girl is called Angelina. Arrest them at once. Guards, guards! Ferraro's voice died away as he ran out of the room. I talked to his vanishing back. That is just what we intend to do, but it's a little difficult at the moment, since they are the ones who not only built the battleship, but undoubtedly stole it as well. It was fully automated, so no crew is necessary. What do you plan to do? one of the clerks asked. I shall do nothing, I told him, with the snapped precision of an old space dog. The League fleet is already closing in on the renegades, and you will be informed of the capture. Thank you for your assistance. End of section two.